Good, good morning, morning everyone. Just a minute. Uh, the time allotted? Six minutes. Yes. Huh? Six minutes. Time around. Hmm. Okay. So good morning everyone. My presentation is eye screening for mentally challenged cohort made easy with portable vision screener. WHO estimate the prevalence of mental retardation being 3% in individual below the age of 18 years. These children are challenging uh, to assess, requiring patience, need skills, and broad range of assessment instrument than the normal children. So we are using photo screener plus optics, that is handheld, portable, and minimal invasives. This photo screeners mostly use objectically screening for the amelogenic risk factors, instabismus, media opacity, and refractive errors. So purpose of our study is ophthalmic screening with vision screener for the sample size of 256 mentally challenged uh, children. We also evaluate sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values. So we include the uh, uh, children aged 2 to 17 years. Exclusion criteria is children above 18 years. Informed consent from the parents was obtained by the study coordinators and the teachers. First, the children uh, were examined by the uh, plus optics, which recorded at pass or refer. Then followed by the optometrist, where it is uh, recorded at visual equity, both the unicular and binocular, and also near and distance and refractions. After that, the children were examined by the op ophthalmologist, strabismus examination, anterior segment examination by the handheld slit limb, and dilated fundus examination, and cyclopathy refraction by the optometrist. So, plus optics uh, vision screeners results was grouped as pass or refer. Or uh, if the screening results was referred, uh, three further attempts were made immediately. And if unsuccessful after fourth attempt, the result was recorded as refer. And also, lack of cooperation in conclusive case also we consider as refer. Here, the ophthalmologists conducting the examination were always marked to the photo screening results. And after that, the screening results was compared with findings of ophthalmological examination at the end. So coming to the result, a total of 256 children of age 2 to 17 years were enrolled in six special schools of Pondicherry and Kadalo districts of uh, South India. And by the vision screener, we got 66% cases report and 33% have no ocular problem. And by ophthalmologist, we got 43% have ocular problems and 57 have no ocular problems. So vision screener show an accuracy of 65 percent sensitivity was 91.1 percent specificity was 52.4 percent positive predictive value was 59.2 percent negative predictive value was 87.4 percent diagnosis wise we uh, got uh, strabismus 21 percent mostly exotropia myopia was 38 percent astigmatism was 19 percent Hypermetropia, uh, chorioretinal coloboma, abjure cataract was 1%, pseudophagia was 5% and others 14%. So performing the complete AI examination on these children can be quite challenging and also time consuming for the ophthalmologists and their staffs. Second thing is it is difficult with communication and social uh, interaction can make the simple task of viralization that uh, quite traumatic. So we found that uh, vision screener is feasible in these children. In our study, the screening process took an average of two minutes, and that an examination with cyclopathy refractions that require uh, around 45 minutes, including the dilatations. And we compare with other study also. Our our study we include all types of children like uh, Down syndrome, autism, delay milestones, uh, epilepsy, and uh, cerebral palsy. So sensitivity is good, that is 91.1%, and negative predictive also also good, 80, that is 87.4%. 80, um, uh, we have also a limitation in the uh, screener that is does not directly detect strabismus, though it is 21 percent, but it is not uh, directly detect the strabismus. It also not uh, able to uh, detect directly optic nerve abnormalities or cordial opacity or cataract. It gives only baseline ophthalmological examination. So, so high sensitivity and high ne negative predictor values and it is non-invasive. So we strongly believe that the vision screener is promising portable tools to detect ocular problems in these children that simplify the ocular examinations. So this is my reference. Thank you. Sir. Okay, doctor, uh, that was an interesting paper. Uh, in fact, uh, particularly uh, looking at the community angle, uh, yes. mentally challenged people. 
I just wanted to confirm that uh, you have uh, given to the ophthalmologist all the cases and then yes, I performed it. Yes, sooner followed by uh, ophthalmologist. Uh, but uh, what about the diagnosis part? Like how many correct diagnoses and all that was made? It, the myopia is a more, mostly common in the diagnosis wise and followed by the stra stra strabismus is there, sir. So myopia according to the way amelogen is expected. That is no, the AFOS uh, diagnosis. No, uh, could you, you know, compare the ophthalmologist versus prosthetics? Yes, sir. As per the diagnosis. As per the diagnosis, uh, well, actually, it is uh, accuracy is uh, 65 percent. So, in the by uh, uh, the this what is the the vision signal we got 33 percent have no ocular problems and 66 have had ocular problems. But in our ophthalmologist, we got the 43 percent have uh, have uh, ocular problem and uh, 67 percent have no ocular problems. Sir. Was there involvement of optometrist, which was more than ophthalmologist here? Yes, sir. Uh, op optometrist. Yes, sir. I can agree to it. Okay. No, no. In this particular project, yes, the role of ophthalmologist and optometrist. Was the role of optometrist more as compared to ophthalmologist? Uh, both are same, sir. Because we do the central vision refraction also in refraction. Mm -hmm. Both the uh, diagnosis wise as well as the refraction wise, it is both uh, more important. Okay. okay. Any questions, sir? From the panel judges, yes, no, sir. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Now the next there one. Hmm. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. All the speakers should wait, eh? Yes, sir. Thank you. Don't go away. Are there any certificates? No. no. Sir, no. call the next person. Dr. Karishma is from. Dr. Mohit Sharma, please. Good morning, one and all. So I'll be presenting the paper. The, the title of my paper is Retrospective Analysis of CSR Patient in Pre and Post COVID Era. I have no any financial interest. Uh, introduction, CSCR is a serious condition which is characterized by localized serious detachment of the sensory retina at the macula, secondary to the leakage from the choreo capillaries through one or more hyperpermeable RP site. So CSR is a vision uh, threatening retinopathy after ARMD, diabetic retinopathy and branch retinal vein occlusion. There is an increased prevalence among men, which was seen in several studies. Approximately 72 to 88 percent of cases occurring in male patients. Uh, CSCR patients are more likely to be exposed to the oral corticosteroid medication and, then, and then at a higher risk of developing CSCR. And considering the route of administration, the most study reported that systemic intake, that is oral or intravenous, is the independent risk factor for CSCR. Uh, CSR has, has also described after local administration of corticosteroid via, uh, via other routes like inhaled or internasal epidural, intraarticular, topical dermal or periocularly. Uh, the scientists genuinely observed a correlation between the CSCR and type A personality pattern characterized, characterized by a competitive drive, urgency and aggressive nature and a, host and a hostile temperament. Another study reported high levels of emotional distress, depression in CSR patients. Now coming to the next study, the objective is to determine the risk factor in COVID-19 patients leading to the development of CSCR. So material method, a retrospective observation study was done in a tertiary care center from February 2019 to January 2021, including all previously diagnosed CS CSCR cases and categorized them into two groups. So one group is pre-COVID CSR group with patient diagnosed with CSR between February 2019 to January 2020, and a post-COVID CSR group which was newly diagnosed CSR cases between February 2020 to till January 2021 and the all the available retrospective data includes demographic detail, history of any risk factor like steroid intake, presenting complaint, fundus photography and OCT if available. So the exclusion criteria in post-COVID group, those which was previously diagnosed with CSR, we have excluded them and uh, if any other history like renal disorder, hypertension, and sleep disorder, smoking, alcohol, we have excluded them and any chronic CSR cases in pre-COVID group and patient where the data was insufficient or missing. Now coming to the result, so in the pre-COVID group we have 194 patients, after which 132 were male, 62 were female, aging between 20 to 40 years. In post-COVID group, there were 290 patients, in, uh, in, out of which 170 were male, 120 were female, aging between 21 to 48 years. So pre-COVID as well as in post-COVID group, the CSCR were detected more in male as compared to female, which was statistically significant. And the ratio, male ratio female in pre-COVID era was 2 to 1, and in post-COVID era was 1.4 to 1. And there is increased number of CSR cases in post-COVID group. 
Now this is the demographic table in, the, with, in which the p-value is statistically significant. Similarly, we can see here in pre-COVID group, we have 194 CSR cases. In COVID group, we have 290 cases. Now, most common complaint of the patient in both pre- and post-COVID group was uh, metamorphosia. The mean duration of presentation in post-COVID group was two months. Visual equity in pre-COVID group is ranging from 6 by 6 to 6 by 12, as compared to post-COVID group ranging from 6 by 6 to 6 by 24. Now, coming to the steroid intake, we can see in the pre-COVID group, only 10 were taking the steroid. In post-COVID group, it's 119, which was statistically significant. Uh, here we can also see the same thing. In pre-COVID group, only 10 as compared to the post-COVID group, which is 119. Now, so out of 194 in pre-COVID group, only 10. That is 5% patient has history of steroid intake. But in post-COVID group, that was 119. That is 41% of the history of steroid intake, which was statistically significant, as I've already shown in my table. And bilaterality of disease is increased from 2 to 13 cases after COVID. That is in post-COVID group. OCD thickness is ranged from 290 to 370 micron in pre-COVID group in comparison to post-COVID group, which was ranged from 319 to 450. After, two, after 290 patients in post-COVID group, only 14% had a history of hospitalization and all of them had a history of steroid intake. Now, this is some of the photos of the patient. Uh, this is the fundus photograph. Uh, this is the OCT picture showing this neurosensory elevation with small PD. Now, coming to the discussion, there is increase in CSR cases from 119 pre-COVID to 219 post-COVID group. The number of males were more in both pre- and post-COVID group, which was statistically significant. Mean age ranging from 20 to 40 years in pre-COVID group as compared to 21 to 48 in post-COVID group. There were increase in number of female cases in post-COVID group. That is, male ratio female decreasing from 2 ratio 1 in pre-COVID to 1.4 ratio 1 in post-COVID group. And the post-COVID group, there was pragmatic increase in steroid intake, that was 41%. Consequence of which, there is increase in bilaterality of disease, increase in subretinal fluid in OCT, and decrease in male patient. And only 41, that is 14% were hospitalized and all of them had a history of steroid intake. Other with positive history had an irrational use of steroid and some of them had a history of steroid use out of stress and anxiety. So concluding my study, the COVID epidemic is still going on in our country with new waves and new variant of COVID still causing a havoc. And our study is first of a kind that established a correlation of CSR with COVID-19 and with outburst of COVID cases, there was a pragmatic increase in stress and anxiety in the patient and the irrational use of steroid ultimately increasing the CSR cases in the post-COVID era. These are my references. Thank you. And Dr. Mohit, uh, that was quite illuminating. Uh, you tried to see the difference in COVID and pre-COVID. But don't you think this is an effect of the steroid only, nothing to do with the COVID? Sir, uh, there's not much uh, references, but there's one study which saying COVID itself also increases the permeability of the uh, RP endothelial cells. So yeah. and uh, steroid as well as the stress which was there associated with the COVID-19. Uh, all these three are the uh, mo most common causes for which CSR has increased in the post-COVID group. So maybe we, what, what is your message at the end actually? Uh, sir, the message is uh, basically because of the anxiety. The, the, the first thing is the stress, anxiety and second is the irrational use of the steroid in the patient who don't require steroid also. Like no, they are not. All that is well established. For COVID? for COVID, yes, sir. Sir, for COVID. So, why can you say it is not necessary for COVID? <coughs> sir? Not necessarily for COVID. Yes, sir. Yes, not, not necessary for COVID. So, really, uh, we are not, I'm not very, you know, convinced that no, COVID. Not convinced. Yeah. Uh, so, maybe you need further studies. I'm not sorry, sorry. I'm Dr. Shreya. Okay. No, I'm not speaking, sir. I'm okay. 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 Yes, ma'am. So come here. <laughs> come this way. I just wanted to say that uh, that's the bonding factor, what you said. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Shia ji ko ye do paper. She can mark it. Yeah. Come. Uh, one more thing. Why it's uh, more in males otherwise? What do you feel the reason is? Uh, sir, as such, there's no, uh, no reason why there is more in males. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in post-COVID group, because of this steroid, it's equal in males and females. Please come this time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. One person is already presented. Have yeah, you heard sorry, that? I'm extremely sorry, my talk. But have you heard okay. that? Okay. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Now the next presenter, Dr. Jalak Shah. Dr. Jalak Shah is present. Right. <coughs> Dr. Jalak is a new member. Welcome to AIOS.
and you must be knowing that uh, this is a competitive session yes. where since you are not ratified you will be you know heard and praised but maybe this year you will not be eligible for the award okay please go everybody ahead. knows that suppose you are getting up, means you are applying this year your membership gets ratified in the agm till the time you are member but non ratified and non ratified member can present but not eligible for getting any mass or any award yeah, only but two are there yeah good experience for you to present okay go ahead start okay. good morning everyone <clears throat> i will be presenting a paper on tele ophthalmology a model for eye care delivery system in rural areas of south gujarat uh, tele ophthalmology is a community outreach program in rural and tribal areas of india lack of ophthalmologist or proper infrastructure has led to delay in the diagnosis of preventable causes of blindness it can also be particularly helpful during the recent covid-19 pandemic to decrease in person consultation and maintain social distancing tele consultation can evaluate the patient similar to face to face consultation through video conferencing <coughs> and help identify the ones who are truly in need of an expert ophthalmologist care furthermore this model also allows the patient to avail eye care near to their homes and avoid significant burden of travel and loss of daily wages thus it can prove to be more cost effective and saves time and effort of both patients as well as experts So the aim uh, of the present study is to explore the role of ophth uh, tele ophthalmology as a model for detection of eye disorders in rural and tribal areas of Gujarat having limited access to ophthalmic care. It was a prospective observational cross sectional study conducted during May 2021 to July 2021 during 3 um, for 3 months of duration. and uh, it included eight vision centers and three satellite centers of the hospital in the nearby rural and tribal regions linked to the base hospital via tele ophthalmological means all the patients who underwent tele consultation during the study period and who gave the consent were included in the study and patients who refused to provide the consent were excluded from the study <coughs> preliminary uh, information of the patient was recorded upon visit followed by clinical examination carried out by the trained ophthalmic assistant present at each center the live feed of the examination was transmitted to the base hospital along with the detail of the patient the ophthalmologist at the base hospital evaluated the clinical data and interacted with the patient and the technician while uh, real time video conferencing these are the results a total 1000 tele consultation were conducted during the study period and the majority of the patients were from age group 41 to 70 years out of the 1000 eye examination 51% were female and 49% were male uh, combining all the examination from the 11 centers 65.2% patients were from tribal community while 34.8% patients were non tribals so out of the 1000 patients a uh, majority of patients were of cataract followed by refractive error constituting 30.1% and 29% respectively um 42.1% of the patients were referred to the base hospital for further evaluation so it uh, saved the visit of 57.9% of the patients out of uh, out of which 15.1% were provided medical treatment at the center 29% were given glasses at the vision center 9.7% of the patients were called for follow up at the center and uh, ophthalmic examination of 4.1% of the patients were within normal limits this model is found to be feasible cost effective and acceptable in our study and agrees with pratibha and rema to apply tele ophthalmology as an effective model for eye care in rural and underserved areas in india Our data indicate that maximum number of patients who came for tele consultation for visual impairment were having either cataract or uncorrected refractive errors. Similar results were found in another study conducted by Shankara Netralay in rural regions of South India. Timely assessment of the cataract and uh, respective referral to the base hospital can lead to significant reduction in the preventable blindness in such underserved regions. In current study glasses were provided to 290 of the patients with uncorrected refractive errors suggesting an important step towards correction of error and thereby prevention of visual impairment Additionally several patients were detected with treatable, uh, treatable medical conditions like conjunctivitis, tigh callejon and blepharitis 
दिस वर काउंसल्ड एंड प्रोवाइडेड मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट एट द विजन सेंटर इट सेल्फ सो इट हेल्प इन सेविंग द टाइम एंड मनी ऑफ द पेशेंट्स आर डेटा इंडिकेट वन पॉइंट सेवन परसेंट ऑफ द पेशेंट्स डिटेक्टेड विद ग्लॉकोमा अ मेटा एनालिसिस सजेस्टेड दैट ग्रेटर नंबर ऑफ केसेस ऑफ ग्लॉकोमा आर डिटेक्टेड यूजिंग टेली ऑफ्थर्मोलॉजी दैन इन पर्सन एग्जामिनेशन इन द प्रेजेंट स्टडी मेजोरिटी ऑफ रेटाइनल केसेस वर डायबिटिक रेटेनोपैथी फॉलोड बाई ड्राई ए आर एम डी रिसेंट मेटा एनालिसिस ऑल्सो सजेस्ट दैट टेली रेटाइनल स्क्रीनिंग शोड हाई एक्यूरेसी इन टर्म्स ऑफ सेंसिटिविटी एंड स्पेसिफिसिटी इन कंपेरिजन टू ट्रेडिशनल फेस टू फेस एग्जामिनेशन सो टू कंक्लूड द टेली ऑफ थर्मोलॉजी इज एक्सेप्टेबल एंड फिजिबल टूल फॉर प्रोवाइडिंग आई केयर इन रूरल एंड ट्राइबल रीजन ऑफ गुजरात वेर एक्सेस टू एक्सपर्ट ऑफ थर्मोलॉजिस्ट इज नॉट पॉसिबल ऑल दो चैलेंजेस स्टिल एग्जिस्ट द पेंडेमिक हेज एक्सेलरेटेड द एडोप्शन ऑफ टेली ऑफ थर्मोलॉजी एज अ रिजल्ट इट विल प्ले एन इंटीग्र रोल इन प्रोवाइडिंग हाई क्वालिटी एफिशियंट केयर these are my references thank you good i think it was a nice presentation teleophthalmology is the need of the hour what are the drawbacks of teleophthalmology mm, there is a need for a high initial investment mm. the cost of the investment then poor quality of the images the patient's concern regarding the accuracy what are the medical legal aspects medical legal aspects when you are checking the patient why tell you of thermology you can okay okay just over there on so both the ads which kind of you have this source young kid there on yeah. both the ads she, uh, she said some optometrist was there isn't it ophthalmic assistant is there more ophthalmic than the ophthalmic armd sir they just showed the fundus picture fundus picture and, and, and on other side was it only slit lamp or camera mount it was a uh, camera mount camera. Yes. retinal camera was there yeah. fundus picture was there okay. i think you, yeah hey please i have one question you said the uh, 35 40% was cataract yes. post operative evaluation was done by tele ophthalm or yes visits yes to the center the first post op visit it was at the base hospital then the subsequent visit were at the a vision centers okay i think uh, i'll just add you did well in the study design that is a very important part uh, in presentations because this is uh, all you know new presenters so you mentioned the study design that was good and sometimes the sample size or how because it is a prospective study you must say that uh, how it was selected 1000 or maybe time bound you can say that you just got can't say hazar ho gaya band karo you do, that's not acceptable very highly and uh, about uh, observation is that you said cataract fine cataract is uh, most uh, you know in all all our studies but i think it would be useful uh, if you see uh, what were the cataracts 3 plus 4 plus which needed early so that this teleophthalmology helped them you know help the society or the ophthalmologists i think that would be interesting Thank I you. think uh, last couple of years it was not physical conference of all India ophthalmological society, and we were on the Zoom platform. Mm -hmm. So the difference of physical conference and online conference, the same way tele ophthalmology and exactly checking the patient in front of each other. Another thing is about artificial intelligence, and nowadays every technology is trying to it means replace the human intelligence, and that shouldn't happen. Our skills of ophthalmologists they are very important. of course such technologies like tele ophthalmology artificial intelligence definitely they will be running parallel hand in hand so we must try to meet both ends all together okay. and reach to the nice conclusion for the betterment of society and patients thank you thank you next one dr john yeah good morning everyone so i am going to present pocket fundoscope designing and 3d printing of foldable ultra portable smartphone fundus camera i am dr john davis from western eye hospital cochin and also at chaitanya eye hospital cochin mm -hmm. so uh, commercial interest i do have a patent pending on this so i do have a commercial financial interest in this presentation so retinal fundus photographs are clinically very useful and important multiple smartphone fundus cameras have been designed in re recent years for low cost fundus photography that is mediatic fundus photography 
they are handheld but they are not small enough to be carried patented and prototyped a working foldable pocket fundascope that is what this is about uh, the aim was to design and make a foldable smartphone fundus camera that can fit inside a pocket using the technology of 3d printing for prototyping this was done on multiple software on a computer and 3d printed using an fdm printer and uh, the software used was freecad and fusion 360 for designing the soft uh, the model cura and creality slicer for uh, converting into a, a method for the 3d printer and then the 3d printer we used uh, multiple 3d printers this was a creality ender 3 pro and uh, this is how the design was made so i had tried multiple designs i had tried a telescoping design finally ended up using a folding design and this was first drawn on paper we tested it on cardboard and then modeled in 3d in freecad all by myself uh, the telescoping design was not uh, very stable so that was uh, discarded uh, this has multiple parts including interlocking hinges joints and a case to hold the 20 diopter lens this was printed using an fdm printer this is pla could also print on abs plastic the design was created and 3d printed uh, using the ender 3 printer prototypes were tested and the final design was chosen and uh, this was used to take smartphone fundus photographs this is how the smartphone is attached to it this is where the lens is and uh, i'll show you how it works this there are several designs of smartphone fundus camera such as the do it yourself red cam which dr biju raju and myself had published in igo in 2016 the made in india mii red cam by dr ashish sharma trash to treasure red cam by dr prithvi chandrakam who, uh, who is here and so on and uh, these are all large size mediatic fundus cameras this new design is folding to fit into your pocket that is the usp of this and uh, this is how it looks this is how it unfolds you unfold it and ask the patient to look into the distance and you take a fundus photograph right and these are the photographs taken with this this the lens had some artifact that is why there is some uh, you know um, blurring here but if you have a smartphone fundus photograph you know that the clarity can get much better it depends on the phone and the lens these are some of the other photographs taken with this these are my references thank you i think a wonderful innovation and uh, you should present this in innovations of ophthalmology session oh, he has already done i've done that i've done that another thing is what is the cost of this instrument so for me i was working in uh, ramchandra medical college mm. and when i uh, use a printer there it was free for me mm. except for designing and all that mm. so i went to a shop a 3d printing shop outside and asked them i have this file can you print this 840 rupees okay and the comparable versions of this type of uh, yeah, so they sell it for uh, different cost 19999 and uh, uh, what is the difference in the technology of those they are not foldable hmm. this is foldable so this is better hmm. for um, so this is the manufacturing cost i have a patent so i yeah, won't be selling at that manufacturing to. cost have you tried i'll patenting yes sir patenting is a uh, pa uh, provisional patent is granted hmm. uh, final patent the full specification will be done in a couple of months so at, this at, is at present how at how many places and how many people are using this uh, so this uh, this is only in uh, ramchandra medical college so i was there in ramchandra medical college for the past 2 years and now i have come back to cochin so it's there only in uh, two places as of now i have shifted back to cochin which is my hometown so chennai and cochin well, two places may, miss, where you in the mood of uh, asking others to utilize it and yes sir share so their experiences yes sir so i have uh, taught my postgraduate students and my colleagues there in uh, faculty colleagues in ramchandra medical college to use it uh, there is the same learning curve as a smartphone fundus camera if any of you have used a smartphone fundus camera there is a learning curve in aligning it mm. so i actually teach them that one of the hands has to go to the brow of the patient so that this is aligned properly many people don't tend to do that and then the phone has to be perfectly centered for the illumination 
and the camera to go through the same lens and then you have to zoom in a little more and if you are comfortable you can use a regular phone camera app or you can use the Ullman indirect app or the MIA red cam app or the hope scope app which are other apps which have settings for adjusting the focus illumination on and saving the images in a EMR like system I think uh, whether you're tired it or not but I'll suggest you one thing give yes, this piece to somebody else who is using other types other versions yes sir. so and then ask that comparison yes sir what so, that person feels whether some lacunas are there in that model or this model what uh, extra thing you can improve upon like that yes sir so i have do it yourself red cam i have hope scope mm. and uh, my colleague there has the mir red cam mm. so i asked them to use all this mm. this was very very convenient and the learning curve was exactly the same in fact even though they had the hope scope there, they were not using it because it was too big to carry around and use. So once this was there, they were able to take it to the bedside of patients, take fundus photographs. So the learning curve is exactly the same. The convenience is much, much more. One more thing, why you have written fundus for your presence here? Uh, yes, sir. So my name is John Davis and I call myself John Da Funda. And so that is why I named it okay, John it Das Fundas. It is not spelling mistake. It is no, sir. It's a Fundas. Uh -huh. it, it's <laughs> Fundas. <laughs> <laughs> My email address <laughs> is John Da Funda. Website yeah. is Funda Zone. <laughs> I made a telescoping one. No, not telescoping. It's the same design. No, I wanted it foldable so that it fits in your pocket. You don't carry your pocket every time you are a doctor. You can carry a small bag. So that when you are making a foldable. Yes, sir. No sir, the cost is not increasing. Because the whole story is with the lens only. Yes sir. And this, this in addition, it works as a case for the lens. So that is the advantage. The other devices, they are big. You need to carry a bag to take it along. Because of that, the people who bought it and kept it there were not using it. Because unfortunately, people are too lazy to carry a bag along just because, you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. So the studies are ongoing. I haven't uh, gathered information yet to do a, a comparison study. Any, any comparison you have never done? No, sir. No, not. Uh, this is very recent. This is uh, last part of COVID uh, innovation. This is okay. an idea which I had before. Sir? Yes, sir. Anything? Yes, sir. Really Anything? Nine four double eight five. Four seven zero seven two. Just send me a WhatsApp, and uh, sales will be there soon. Thank you. Thank you. Commercial so interest. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Doctor Maheshwari has. Dr. Maheshwari, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, one and all. I'm myself, Dr. Maheshwari. I'll be talking on trash to treasure red cam, treasure to save sight amidst pandemic. Diabetes is a global epidemic, please, and India please, is afterwards. considered to be a uh, diabetic capital of the world. Doctor, it is projected John. to grow. Please, please. It is projected to grow to a 101 million by 2030 and 134.2 million by 2045. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema are two main site-threatening components of diabetic retinopathy. The national survey conducted in 2015-19 to 19 reported that 16.9% of those with diabetes mellitus had diabetic retinopathy in India and 3.6% had site-threatening diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy meets the criteria of WHO screening. The criteria for DR screening is in case of type 1 diabetes within 5 years after diagnosis and annually thereafter, type 2 diabetics first retinal examination at the time of diagnosis of DM and then annually thereafter, women with gestational diabetes, not a known diabetic but with random blood sugar of more than 200 mg per deciliter or HbA1c of more than 6.5. So to evaluate, uh, my aim of the study was to evaluate diabetic retinopathy screening using trash to treasure red cam at vision centers in rural and underserved areas in Tamil Nadu for teleophthalmology during the pandemic. So this is a prospective hospital based study conducted at 11 vision centers over the time span of six months. 
patients visiting the vision centers uh, were uh, selected for this and an informed consent was taken detailed history was taken and rbs was checked visual acuity and refraction was done detailed ocular examination was done and fundus photo dilated fundus photography using trash to treasure red cam was taken image was remo remotely analyzed by retinal surgeon and grading was done and patients requiring intervention was referred to a tertiary high hospital so to come to the results over a period of 6 months 11 vision centers 1904 patients were screened out of which 851 were diabetic patients so 15% of them were already a known case of diabetic retinopathy and 85% that is 61 patients were a newly diagnosed diabetic retinopathy 49 of 72 patients were referred to tertiary eye hospital for further examination and management the mean age of patients in the study group was around 54.4 years out of 49 referred patients 14 were lost to follow 56 eyes of 35 patients were diagnosed to have vision threatening diabetic retinopathy and was referred in need of treatment to tertiary hospital after clinical examination and multimodal imaging at retina clinic in tertiary hospitals 45 percent 45 eyes that is 80.35 percent were advised treatment these are some of the images taken using trash to treasure red cam so the treatment included pan retinal photocoagulation intravitreal anti vgf and steroid injection injections and PRP and vitreoretinal surgery. Coming to the discussion, with the epidemic of DM-related visual impairment and blindness looming on us, it is imperative that we take all measures to reduce the burden. At the height of pandemic, elective services like community-based screening for diabetic retinopathy was halted universally to prevent community spread of COVID. So early detection of diabetic retinopathy by regular screening can help in slowing the progression of any diabetic retinopathy to sight threatening diabetic retinopathy with good con uh, control of modifiable risk factors. So the model of diabetic retinopathy screening includes uh, selective screening and population based screening. So it can be done either hospital based, community based or teleophthalmology. So at present situation of pandemic, teleophthalmology plays a very important role in screening of diabetic retinopathy patients by bridging a gap of distance, time and burden on manpower. The available devices for this can be either ta tabletop, handheld or smartphone based devices. So many uh, studies have been con uh, conducted and international acceptance and concurrence that the screening test for diabetic retinopathy should have at least 80% sensitivity, 95% specificity and less than 5% technical failure rates. Coming to Trash to Treasure Red Cam, it's a simple, affordable, portable, wireless, do-it-yourself kind of a device which is done using uh, already used uh, hand sanitizer empty bottles, chart paper, uh, mobile holder and uh, smartphone and a 20 diopter lens. These are some of the images taken using uh, Trash to Treasure Red Cam. See, these are the cases of diabetic retinopathy. So the trash retreasure at has been able to pick up findings like dot blot hemorrhages, hard exudates, soft exudates, superficial hemorrhages, IRMA, NVE, NVD, tractional bands, laser marks, CSME, which pose a threat to the vision. Although it can di misdiagnose, miss the diagnosis of mild NPDR, it has been able to diagnose sight threatening cases. So the parameters on which a successful teleophthalmology program can run are diagnostic accuracy and cost effectiveness. The study conducted to uh, Estimate the efficacy of trash to treasure red cam in diabetic retinopathy screening showed sensitivity of 88.4%, specificity of 100%, and it costs only about uh, 500 rupees in making this device. It also reduces the travel and time cost and loss of income of patients. So, to conclude, trash to treasure red cam is a smartphone based tele screening device with very minimal investment, which can be used in peripheral centers associated with multi specialty eye hospital for screening. It is time that diabetic retinopathy screening evolve into ophthalmology supported, ophthalmologist supported rather than continue to be an ophthalmologist led screening program and the overall final cost benefit is larger than conventional screening programs. These are my references. Thank you. So what is the USP of this uh, trash to treasure it can? Yeah, what is the main thing you want to convey? Like uh, John said, it is foldability of that thing. So this is uh, mainly used, you have done do-it-yourself kind of a device. Do it yourself. So usually our, uh, we have a vision centers which is by run or by MLOPs who are trained. So we can make uh, use of this which is very simple, cost effective and just uh, they send it via uh, Just show it, just show it. Yeah. Uh, so this is the device okay. uh, which has a sanitizer bottle. Okay, and this is a mobile holder which can be available in Amazon everything 
and this is a 20 diopter lens and this is any smartphone can be used uh, for taking these images so this uh, anybody can use and most of our uh, even uh, not just for screening purpose even the trainees are using this so that they can discuss with their consultants and the MLOPs will be forwarding the images to the retinal department uh, then we will uh, tell them about the treatment protocol whether it is needed and they will refer only those cases which we ask them to refer so when our hospital which runs min minimum of three to four camps per week for diabetic screening which was halted during pandemic so we u made use of this so that we can continue our diabetic retinopathy screening cost is i mean it mainly for this we cost uh, my uh, the mobile holder as such approximately uh, yeah for around oh. 500 rupees like uh, on amazon other than that, this and all is... Uh, Out of the one question, how it differs with that portable... Previous one. Suppose there is a debate. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, wants, yeah. He yeah. wants to say his is the best. How would you say yours so, is the best? Uh, this is one of the inventions. There are many devices. No, no, no. This is a do sort it yourself. Of debate, yeah. uh, do it yourself kind of a device. Hmm. So anybody can do it themselves. Like you this think is this is better than that? Yeah, I can <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, we are yeah, all. You have to prove. Yeah, I can say so. You can make it yourself. You don't have to depend on anybody. So is it on YouTube? Just remember. To make it? Yes, we sir. are here. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. You, you have see, sir wants 20 to years junior, that's why you are sitting there. Uh -huh. We are 25 years senior, that's why we are sitting here. Sir wants to use either that or this. He wants to get convinced himself. Yeah, this is the plus point. Make it make it yourself. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, next one, Dr. Mohanty Gayatri. Yes, Dr. Mohanty. You are? Dipali Parmar. No, Which paper? Name? Which your paper name? yours is? Paper nine. Shri Divya. Co-author. Co-author. Hmm. The next paper. Very Changing or presenting author is not allowed in actually. Mm. You are Sri Divya? Yes, sir. Okay. That's what we ask. Where is it? Next one. Emerging but innovative screening tools for diabetic retinopathy. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sri Divya. You are Sri Divya. Yeah. Acha, Mohanty is co-author, sorry. Mm. You are the main author. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, the same topic, diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to present about an emerging but innovative screening tool for diabetic retinopathy. As we know, uh, India is infamously known as the diabetic capital of the world, and diabetic retinopathy is the most common microvascular complication we see in patients with diabetes. It's about one in three persons with diabetes mellitus have diabetic retinopathy. The gold standard approach for screening is always regular dilated fundoscopy examinations. But in rural areas of India, the referral to ophthalmologist and screening is poor. So here I'm using a technique called nail fold capillaroscopy. So what is this? Basically, we are examining the nail fold capillaries by using a device called nail fold capillaroscopy on which microvascular changes are being observed. Its advantages are its ease, non-invasiveness, safety, speed of execution time, and low cost. So we have included all the diabetic mellitus patients between the age of 15 to 75 years, and we have excluded certain patients with essential hypertension, peripheral vascular disorders, and collagen vascular disorders, because these may have similar changes on nail fold capillaroscopy. It is a cross-sectional and observational study, and the parameters of our study are capillary density, tortuosity, neoangiogenesis, microhemorrhages, abnormal forms, and vascular areas. We have uh, correlated the findings on fundus along with the capillaroscopic findings, and we have compared them in patients with and without retinopathy. In our study, we have totally examined 250 patients, of which we have equally divided them with, into the groups of non-diabetic retinopathy and diabetic retinopathy, with 125 patients having no diabetic retinopathy and 66 with non-proliferative and 59 with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Coming to the results of our study, when we have compared with the duration of diabetes, when the duration of diabetes is about 16 to 20 years, 
we have seen reduced capillary density and torsicity of nail fold capillaries in about 100% of patients that is in both the groups like 16 to 20 years and also greater than 20 years. Whereas micro hemorrhages and uh, avascular forms and abnormal forms are seen when the duration is 16 to 20 years in about 91% and whereas about uh, when the duration is greater than 20 years it is about in 100% of the patients. We have also compared these nail fold capillaroscopic findings with glycemic control. When there is bad glycemic control, that is HbA1c greater than 8, we had, seen, uh, we had seen that reduced capillary density and toxicity are seen in about 82% of the patients, whereas micro hemorrhages and avascular areas in 91.5% patients, neoangiogenesis in 93.3% and abnormal forms of capillaries in about 100% patients. All of them have statistically, statistically significant values. And finally, when uh, there is a comparison in the different groups of diabetic retinopathy, when there is proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it is about 100% in almost all the patients we have seen reduced capillary density and torsicity, whereas micro hemorrhages and avascular areas in about 83.1% and abnormal forms in 13.6% and neoangiogenesis in 16.9%. Here, I would like to specify this point when there is not, uh, when there is no diabetic retinopathy also, we could see certain findings like reduced capillary density and torsicity in about 16% of patients. So this is a picture showing the fundus photo, OCT, and also the capillaroscopic findings of a single patient. So the uh, image number C is the torsicity of the nail fold capillaries. D, we can see micro hemorrhages. E is neoangiogenesis. And the last one is Jane capillaries, which is an abnormal form. So nail fold capillaroscopy basically visualizes the nail fold capillaries. It is very well documented since years since scleroderma spectrum diseases, whereas its recent use in diabetes mellitus has been documented. And so in different literatures, reduced capillary density, torsicity, ectasias, neoangiogenesis, hemorrhages, abnormal forms, and vascular zones have been documented. We have correlated them with the presence of diabetic retinopathy, degree of diabetic retinopathy, along with duration and control of diabetes. In our study, as I've mentioned, we had very good incidence, that is about 100% in patients with PDR. And also in patients with no retinopathy also, we had certain parameters. So I would like to conclude saying that there is this nail fold capillaroscopic changes have a significant association with severity of diabetic retinopathy, duration of diabetes, and glycemic control. It is identified before the appearance of changes in the fundus. It is a cheap and non-invasive screening tool, and it is useful in prognosis. Thank you. Very nice study. Sir, can I? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, very course. nice study. The only thing you need little multicentric trial for this. Okay. And uh, what you yourself said, 16% had shown some difference. Yes. So have you checked those patients for rheumatoid arthritis because that comes yes, in nail bed when yes, we uh, have, it is we not have excluded diabetic that mellitus. All. And have you compared your data with NGOCT? OCT angiograph? Uh, no, ma'am. OCT no. angio, we didn't. You only didn't. the plain OC, HD OCT only we have done, not okay. with angio OCT. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, isn't it more uh, subjective, the findings? Yes. Uh, is there any, you know, quantify the result? Like it goes, like you're just seeing and s saying, okay, yes, this sir. is the finding. Hmm. Is there any table like this is plus one, two plus, three plus or something like that? No. So I'm not saying this is comparable with the regular uh, fundoscopy examinations of fundus camera. This is only basically in rural areas where there are not much facilities. The regular physicians, they can just have this instrument and they can try to detect it before and refer to the ophthalmologist. I'm never saying that this is a diagnostic tool for uh, diabetic retinopathy. It is just for the physicians or RMPs which normally dominate in our rural areas, even though so people... not for ophthalmologists, as you say. <laughs> Generally, Basically for the community purpose in rural areas, we Physician. can try. Okay. I'm not saying it's a gold standard or it's basically for ophthalmologists. So practically, you are saying it is for practitioners. Screening. Yeah. Yes, sir. Anybody... Screening. Yes, screening. Uh, when... They one, they if they yes, they if they, they find... Uh, and and they, they can... find anything, they can refer it to... Exactly. I think well, basically okay. this is the job 
screening of diabetic retinopathy to prevent the diabetic retinopathy blindness is not only by ophthalmologists, True. but diabetologists, yeah. physicians, yeah. True. then True. paramedics. Yeah. All of us should join hands all together. And I think that is the message you want to give here. Yes, sir. Because and most uh, of them, even though they refer, they don't come. But if they diagnose and if they send it to us, mm -hmm. maybe we can treat them better with early I think intervention. Is, we always tell them. Yes, sir. The people from this. Very rarely they come to us. Yes, sir. After an hour, they to go to the diabetic. But mostly they come from the, the physicians. Uh, from the physicians. Yes. So we sometimes then when we are having a checkup every six months or three months to you, we just have a look at the front of the camera, everywhere, the smartphone or whatever the device you have. Their role is very much important very and complementary for all of us. Actually, we should involve them, we should accommodate them, we yes. should promote them. If you have any doubt, they can send me. Otherwise, we'll say. Because their help is needed definitely yes. in the screening The purpose. same uh, capillaries can also be studied on a small portable dermoscope which is also used by the dermatologist okay. for their uh, scleroderma diseases and all. So that is about uh, 10,000 to 15,000 cost. Mm -hmm. So they use it regularly for their diseases so they can also screen it for us and refer it but to the ophthalmologist. But yours is cheaper you told? Sir? Your experience is cheaper as yes. compared to previous two. That's what, sir. No sir, I, I don't think so. <laughs> How much it is? Uh, the machine costs about, uh, uh, the lower versions are 5,000, sir, and the higher versions are about 20,000. Then, uh, well, as compared to cost, which is little more as, uh, as compared to previous two I presentations, uh, what are the positive aspects of your screen? Sir, uh, that's what I want, like the physicians or the RMPs can screen and send to us. That is what I would like to. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank okay. you very much. Okay, okay thank, you. thank you, sir. Good. We are having the same again, role of smartphone. Yes. <laughs> so now ophthalmology. Oh, fungal care is this. Ophthalmology care All screening are on phone. <laughs> so probably okay, so Dr. Dipali. Dipali, are you there? Yeah, please yeah, come. Welcome. So you have to tell all the comparison of the four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, this <laughs> is for fungal keratitis. After conclusion. Sir, you are discussing here. Your keratitis. equipment, <laughs> your equipment is, is there. It is not for retina. It is for fungal keratitis. Okay. So good morning everyone and uh, I do not have any financial or conflicts of interest. We know that direct microscopy is a very basic modality, however availability and access is an issue in developing countries, hence low cost devices are being explored at point of care. Foldscope is one of such device, composed of paper, magnetic components and a single piece borosilicate glass bowl. It has a resolution of 2 micron and magnification of 140x. So we aim to detect fungal pathogens on direct smears by smartphone uh, mounted foldscope method and to compare the diagnostic utility of foldscope with the compound light microscope as the gold standard. It is a prospective co observational and comparative study. We included samples from the uh, corner scrapping material of clinically suspected patients of fungal keratitis, other organisms and uncooperative patients for the procedures were excluded. The scrapping material was obtained from the, uh, with the standard technique like uh, taking material from the active ulcer age and base and uh, we use uh, smear which is 10% uh, KOH and LCBS they are the easy simple uh, rapid techniques for the staining material uh, as a staining material. All the slides were examined with the foldscope first and then with the compound light microscope. We perform other microbiological workup as well for the clinical management however I am excluding because it is a beyond the scope of the study. So basically there are three different viewing methods for the uh, foldscope. We used phone view method, so I will be uh, describing in detail with this method. Where the prepared slides are placed uh, in the slot provided for the slides and we used LED illuminator as a light source, magnetic coupler to attach the smartphone camera with the device and manual adjustments of the slides were performed to capture the images of the desired quality. With the compound light microscope, 10x and 4x magnification can be used as per the requirement and again with the manual adjustment of the smartphone camera, we can capture the images of the desired area. We avoided uh, uh, bias by blinding of the sequence of the slides and all the results were compared by the single experience microbiologist. Results are noted as a positive and negative for the presence and absence of the fungal elements. Coins kappa method was used to quantify the agreement between two imaging techniques where the minus 1 to 0 shows disagreement, 0 shows poor agreement and 0 onwards up to 1 shows uh, almost perfect strength of agreement as per the increasing value. So we examined total 60 slides, 30 slides for each staining method where both the imaging technique shows moderate agreement, full scope had a sensitivity of 0.71 uh, with a specificity of uh, 1. 
With the KOH and with the LCB respectively, both the method had moderate agreement for the both imaging technique. However, LCB had a better sensitivity compared to KOH in our study. So these are the some images which are captured with the smartphone camera with the both imaging technique for the both staining method. The upper row represent images with the fold scope. Here the area of examination as seen through the fold scope lens is a smaller compared to compound light microscope. However, magnification and quality of images are very much comparable for the diagnosis purpose as well as for the documentation purpose. So in total, we see with LCB and QH respectively 19 and 13 slides shows fungal pathogen with the both imaging technique. We uh, correlate clinical diagnosis with the microbiological diagnosis with the type of organism identified on the culture course. However, I would be excluding detail here for the interest of time. So we know that fungal keratitis is very much common in a rural area, also in farmers, and it is a major cause of corneal blindness among all the microbial keratitis. In such area, the diagnostic facility is not available. Cultures are supposed to be gold standard, but still it is not uh, available or either it is time consuming. So direct smear can be simple rapid method where we can detect fungal pathogen early in a disease and we can limit the progression and corneal blindness. One of the study performed in a western part of the India shows the same that most of us has a tendency to start uh, whenever we suspect the infectious keratitis we would start patient on antimicrobials, uh, uh, specifically antibiotics not the antifungal agents. Foldscope being a very uh, portable tool can be utilized either with the direct viewing method for the diagnosis purpose or with the smartphone camera for the recording and for the documentation or telemedicine. It has been already utilized in other uh, field. However, in ophthalmology, it is underutilized. In our study, we found LCB better over KOH because we used KOH as a plane without any staining, pro uh, like dye or something. The limitation of study is a small sample size with the only two methods being compared. And limitation of so itself is current specification and the small field area of examination. It is not approved for the human health diagnosis as of now. But it is, I think, as per the previous study, it is the only tool which is ready to use, available in, uh, from the online store. And almost cost is less than 500. And <laughs> it has a better magnification compared to the similar devices available in the market. And it does not require any power supply, any service, any maintenance. And during COVID time, it can be like utilized as a uh, use and throw microscopy. So I would conclude that uh, direct smear, especially in remote rural area, can be early sensitive method. And in our experience, LCB or other any stain which gives some contrast to uh, background or color to uh, fungal pathogen is preferred over plain KOH with fold scope initially. It has a limited sensitivity, still it can be utilized as a cost effective alternative in absence of other diagnostic modalities. And with a future possibility of improved specification, it may be have a wider application in human health diagnosis. Thank you. Is it the same? Do you have? Yes, I have. Just demonstrate. Yeah, please. I have already a slide loaded if you want to have experience yourself. Do you need any special application on the phone to run That's this? It. No, this is just a smartphone camera based. So and you can ignore smartphone camera also. You can have a direct viewing for the diagnosis purpose. So it's basically magnifying. Yes, it is just for the documentation and recording purpose. You can uh, use smartphone camera. Otherwise, okay. you don't need it. For okay. the diagnosis, you can direct view and examine. Even with the daylight, you don't need LED also sometimes. Okay. Okay, you want to see? Yeah, please. The smartphone itself through the camera is scratched. Mm. Don't you like the fungus? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there can there can be real fungus. The Sometimes lights. there can and be the real fungus. I think everyone of us has a decent <laughs> quality of smartphone. <laughs> we can always upgrade with the smartphone rather this than the diagnostic this devices. Smartphone. <laughs> when I bought it some money, and <laughs> so even it is scratched. I'm just guessing uh, with that. Going on. Yes. So when you take a photograph, it looks like fungus. So Sir, there is a. Uh, they also provide cotton bud to clean the lens also. Mm. I don't <laughs> give me this that. device. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just 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 show show yes. that to the audience. Yeah. What you have. Uh, so uh, this is the device, and this is a foldable flap. This is a front surface, which is a blue surface, and this is a yellow. This is a back one. So when you are examining with the direct eye viewing, you have to keep the blue surface towards your eye. And we are using a smartphone camera, then it is mounted at the back surface, right? So this is a LED light, which you will require if you are uh, examining, uh, like if you are not having enough uh, daylight or like uh, mm. tube light. And it is not desirable that you do not have to look directly at the bright focus because that would dazzle your... Uh, so you can use this LED light. Relax and 
think that that's a yeah yeah fine fine it's just a just feel like excited yes i'm excited <laughs> yes <laughs> the more you relax you can feel so better if more. you have want to see then you have to say either with the direct eye viewing yourself or if i have to demonstrate i can demonstrate on my smartphone screen itself no you, you can do it off the yeah. set time okay. like no so okay acha are you sure that you are getting some fungal i don't think so sorry sir i didn't get your question when in our practice yes we get get a fungal keratitis or any other thing Sometimes you don't get even on KVS or the mouth also. Yeah. So the, the staining technique itself has a limitation. This is yeah. about like detecting the, the using similar staining technique for the diagnostic. Uh, Suppose you have this. taken hundred cases. Yes. How many cases you have got KVS mouth positive, and how many cases in your things you have got positive? Yes, sir. sir, I have uh, the, during the studies, uh, I have already displayed that results that uh, 32 sites uh, uh, we found positive with the whole scope. Mm. And uh, 45 against the uh, as a gold standard method compound like microscope 45 out of 60 slides. 45 is too much. 45. 45 out of 60 with the compound like microscope as a gold standard. With the whole scope, it was. So you are saying the incidence of uh, fungal keratitis is 65 percent in your study? Not uh, like. 60 slides, you said. 60 uh, total samples we have collected hmm. and there were different staining method 30 for the lcb and 30 for the koh Agreed. we are i am practicing at referral centers where we are getting lot of uh, infectious keratitis so that is okay yes. same yes, question yes, 65% yes. Our, uh, patient 65. volume or is like that fungal cases is a very devastating thing and diagnosing it is a very interesting that is a purpose yeah. to highlight that uh, to improve so the detection to improve the positivity with the microbiome not just the clinical side and it's also you have to treat that like antibiotics these are single use no no it is like i am i am having this device since two years you can like this is not you can use it as a disposable if there is a doubt about the infection transmission or anything otherwise this is there is okay. an, there is another device where they use uh, intraocular lenses yes high high power plus power intraocular lenses yes. one upon the another Uh, do you know of that? Have you compared it? I know glue dial technique. Yeah, glue dial. Ah, Sometimes so oral lab has come out with a 120 power, uh, also. They use four. Uh, yeah, uh, for especially that. I and heard they make 120 power one from oral lab. Yes, mm. yes. So the magnification wise, comparable. Uh, it's comparable. It's okay. Thank you. And that way, very less cost. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. Thank you. Now the next presenter, Dr. Priyanka Saini. and let me announce two names whether they are there or not we had given them the opportunity dr karishma yes. you are here then dr uh, soumik manna no then dr linu jeris no tick you don't know okay only one presenter is remaining now after this hmm. okay start hello everyone my topic is retinopathy of prematurity screening and treatment outcomes in the desert of rajasthan i am dr priyanka saini Uh, there is no financial interest, and the study is approved by ethical committee. ROP is a vasoproliferative disorder occurring principally, but not exclusively, in premature infants and low birth weight infants. Despite advances in neonatal care, it continues to be a leading cause of childhood vision loss worldwide. Arrest of normal neuronal and retinal and vascular development in the preterm infant leads to pathological compensatory mechanisms, mm -hmm. resulting in apparent vascularization of the retina. the more profound the immaturity at the birth and the persistent of developmental arrest due to exposure of retina to harmful factors the more aggressive is the later pathological response early detection so with prompt treatment can lead to uh, burden of blindness and it can be reduced american screening guidelines for rop suggest that babies less than 1500 g birth weight and less than 32 week of gestational age and other than that at the discretion of attending neonatologist should be screened However these guidelines require a modification in developing countries like ours aim of this study is to work out an effective screening criteria and analyze treatment outcomes of rop objective is to document the spectrum of rop in various gestational age group infants and to analyze associated risk factors to compare the outcome of various treatment options available such as laser and anti vgf it was a retrospective non randomized observational studies and the patient was divided into three groups group 1 babies with gestational age up to 30 30 weeks group 
babies with 31 to 34 week gestation age and group 3 more than 34 week gestation age cases were retrospectively collected over a period of 5 years from july 2016 to july 2021 from various centers and screened by a single vr surgeon that is dr rajkumar sharma at a sufficiently warm clean examining station well wrapped babies were screened using aseptic precautions an hour before the examination the pupils were dilated with a combination of 0.5% tropicamide and 2.5% phenylephrine at 5 minute intervals firstly the optic disc and macula were examined using indirect ophthalmoscope and plus 20d lens the peripheral retina was then examined using scleral indentation all examinations were performed by the same ophthalmologist findings of the examination were documented in the funders chart as per icrop classification we found a uh, incidence of 55% in group 1 27.55% in group 2 14.9% in group 3 and a total overall incidence of 36.9% out of the 550 babies which were screened rop was present in 203 babies and treatable rop was present in 70 babies out of which 31 babies were lasered 14 were treated with anti vgf injection and a combination of laser plus injection was given in 19 babies further treatment was required in 6 babies for which they were referred to higher centers now the question arises are some babies missing the bus for the screening yes according to our study 17 babies out of the 203 retina rop positive babies were could have been missed if the current criteria could have been followed and three babies would have missed treatment with the incidence of rop on increase due to improved cervical of low birth weight babies screening of all preterm babies have become essential to detect rop according to our study infants born at less than 37 weeks should be screened at least once for rop at 4 to 6 week of chronological age irrespective of the neonatal course although a number of significant risk factors came across during the study prematurity and low birth weight were the most constant significant risk factors prompt treatment with laser therapy anti vga for a combination of both has helped to prevent progression of rop and reducing the individual and societal burden of rop blindness we conclude by saying that late preterm infants must be screened for rop especially those born in developing country like ours at least once for rop irrespective irrespective of the presence or absence of risk factors thank you thank you uh, dr nag sir you want to ask that about your uh, membership number what's your membership number sir it's p uh, 253 yeah you're so not ratified, ratified it seems or non ratified non ratified no just this year i yeah so this will not be eligible not for i think no, no, it is not some of they missed it please note it that this is uh, so you are not ratified right ah. no, sir, not is, not for the competition you are not okay. for, not so for, now sir, will not enter the mark yes, do not enter no. ah, not ratified like this yeah. it is not written yeah. miss kar gaya sir like here it is Next written is presenting it is it is not written there so why should not we mark ऊपर लिख दिया ना सर इधर तो नो विद देन फॉर दिस टू यहां पे दिया है मेंबरशिप का स्टफ 24773 तक फर्स्ट पेज में देखिए हां 247 तक है हर इज बियॉन्ड मैडम और 25 है नेक्स्ट इज डॉक्टर करीश प्रेजेंटिंग ऑथर इज अ नॉन रेटिफाइड मेंबर ओके कैन वी शुड मार्क इट टू प्लीज मार्क इट बिकॉज़ दे हैव नॉट मेंशनड इट यू कैन रेटिफिकेशन दे कैन चेक ओके Uh, how is it different oh, sorry it is rajasthan so my study was no, based no, no. on it is a rajasthan ophthalmic society you know society is a very prestigious body yes if it is done study can be done by a particular doctor you have named one sir, doctor as kumar sharma or something like that sir uh, observation bias was uh, every all the cases were seen by him yes you sir. told yes sir so you can I mean, his study but why you gave a name of rajasthan ophthalmic society sir actually it was a direct entry by the state based paper so that's why it is mentioned there okay so it is a privilege a prestige so it is yeah. prestige so writing the name of the society yes sir it is I prestige so i did not write the name you have written the article who sent the article you sent the article sir it is directly sent by the society yeah sir actually the, the top papers from each state are taken <laughs> probably it must be their state top ah, papers isiliye wo sab ho gaya how is it different from routine studies other than your study so my study wants to say that we should not miss rop babies and like other papers were presented where there were uh, innovations of red camps uh, easy to make red camps 
more the screening is done, lesser the babies are left out and less the burden, societal burden is reduced. So I, uh, my study basically wants to say that more and more babies should be screened for ROP so that the life, uh, the vision threatening uh, uh, illness can be prevented. Yours was the top paper in the Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society Conference? Yes, sir. And in that category, you are presenting here? Yes. Sir. Okay, well, okay. One more question. Yes, sir. In the setting of our session, sir asked a question about the legal point. Medical legal. Medical legal point. Yes, sir. So, what is the medical legal point of ROP? You told that the surgery should not be. What is the thing? Sir, Do you know few doctors have been penalized for not yes, sir. doing a screening? Yes. Uh, for ROP? Yeah, that's why, sir. That's why my study uh, says that uh, more and more babies should be screened. More than all? All, yes. Sir. All. There is no more. All. All. You shouldn't miss. Should Missing and not advising a baby to screen is medical legal. Medical legal. Yes, sir. One, yes, sir. one more thing I'd like to share here. Like in American format and British and Indian format, the date written is little different. Yes, sir. Suppose it is 5-7-2022, mm -hmm. means it is 5th July in India. But in America, it is 7th May. Yes. And if you are asking the patient and writing on the case paper, the patient may go for the different date, interpreting himself or herself in a different way. Medical legally, it is a problematic thing. So it is better to write 5th May. Okay. Or 7th June, whatever it may be. Or 7th May. Yeah. So also you must write the date pro and uh, yeah. month and properly. It is all. Now more. Yes. One and all. all. Mm -hmm. And we should not miss. Yes. Now it is, we are developing country, so we should not miss any other. Because you haven't told and patient has not come for screening. And it patient gets blind. It is targeted yes. for your wrong advice and not telling the baby and uh, not telling the parents properly to come for the screening. So, it, uh, yes, sir. We always do a video screening, hmm. a video counseling also. That's good. So Only the thing sir, is, patients. Do a video counseling or video screening, always give some documentation. No, no, we keep that. Uh, no, video counseling will not be. Uh, it, you do that is better. Only the thing is interpretation, interpretation of what advice you are given, whether patient has understood, patients and relatives they have understood properly or not. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my advice is to uh, give the mask for this because mm, yeah. they might have thought because uh, the top papers from all ophthalmological state yes. societies mm, they are asking okay. and if it is the comparison okay. and then what I have done just I will show just you like that, not and then uh, I have written presenting author is not ratified member it's okay. up to them to yeah, yeah. take into consideration yeah, all, all of marked. that's what I feel so yeah. that there will be the uniformity thank, thank you I told you that thank I you give the mask and thank you so okay. much thank you now the next is Dr. Karishma Dr. Karishma why are you late when your name was announced? Uh, sir, I was in the other house hmm. before, hmm. where I had one presentation Okay. So, you are given the opportunity, but otherwise in the sequence, we had announced I'm your really name. Sorry. No issue. So, every uh, judge is allowing her to present, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. First one. First one. Now, there is nobody in the audience and she is the last speaker. Okay? Yeah. Because one more person is Linu Jeris. We are writing her as absent. Absent. Sobi. Sobi ki jo sir. Sobi ki sir. Sir, is now start. Good morning, all. I am here to talk about the improvement in outcomes of school eye screening program through repeated reminder phone calls. As we know, India is home of growing and largest childhood population in the world, which contribute around 40 percent of total population. So what is the need of this study? This can only be understood if we know what are the impacts of decreased vision in a child. 80% of what a child learns is through vision. So childhood ocular morbidity can hinder child motor development, language skills, cognitive skills, his education, personality and financial outcomes. So we can say that the childhood blindness can ultimately affect a family and a society. So it is very, very essential to plan strategies to fight at the root level difficulties like cultural barriers and practices and socio-economic barriers. One such initiative is School Eye Screening Program, which is the second largest program under NPCB after cataract surgery. This program includes vision assessment and gross eye examination like uh, pupillary reflex measurement, ocular motility and red reflex. 
so what after the screening all the children with eye problems were referred to higher center for further evaluation and management this is where we are lagging behind various barriers have been identified which create hindrance in this referral path and delay in treatment of some of these eye problems can cause irreversible vision loss through amblyopia and other complication so what was our focus our approach relies on the uh, telecommunication in which a trained telecaller prompts the parents of the identified children to reach to the base hospital and the objective of our study is to evaluate the effect of these repeated reminder phone calls In this prospective cohort study a trained telecaller discussed the severity management and prognosis of eye disease with the parents and motivated them to reach to the hospital In this module reminder call is given to the non reporting parents on day 15 and then on day 30 and 45 uh, after the eye screening Now coming to the results 3.5% of all the screen children were referred for further management Here the crucial point is that only 10% of all the referred children reported to the hospital by themselves. Here we can clearly see that the self-reporting percentage was very low which improved significantly through the rep- uh, reminder phone calls. In our study major cause of referral was the refractive error followed by various other ocular pathologies and here in flowchart we can see that of all the referred cases the reporting has been increased through reminder phone call still there is a huge lacuna of non reporting so what are the factors responsible for this non reporting a proper questionnaire was prepared and a set of question were asked to the parents telephonically and we came on conclusion the lack of awareness was the major limiting factor followed by the financial constraint and the transport issues so these screening programs are very helpful to detect the uh, unidentified vision problem in children and guide the parents for further evaluation lack of awareness was the major limiting factor in these uh, screening programs but our approach of reminder phone calls is very effective to overcome these problems so in conclusion uh, our study emphasized the need for preschool screening and improving the referral follow up by creating awareness through reminder phone calls thank you good now in few schools i think it is mandatory that every year they ask their students to get the medical check up done basically in the private schools yes but when it is the government school the school for poor children basically parents they are not taking that much care and then when it is free they feel that something experiment experiment may be done on our children and then they don't take seriously and because of few other issues also when they are busy in their farms and on their work they don't take their children to hospital. hospital and screening in that case even phone calls they don't attend and then they don't follow you can't follow those parents in that case what you do so in our study the uh, we included only the parents who take up our call and uh, discuss the disease management and prognosis with us so they you did not should follow uh, the yeah. follow up the parents who did not take up our phone yeah so it is possible that the parents you yourself call or teacher call a you yourself call yeah. yeah so it is possible that you can remind again to teacher you take your device to the school itself and you can do comparative study non reminding how they presented how what they lost by not coming and uh, who are benefited so okay. that can be a yeah. we'll do it in extension future. of the study which uh, age group school, uh, which age group school First to I mean, from five to fifteen years. Yes. So you have talked about childhood blindness. Means uh, uh, children below five years are not screened. Uh, they are going to school also. They are going to school. They may be having some problem like retinoblastoma, squint, something of that sort. In uh, age group less than five. So we mainly. Uh, you have not mentioned anything about the age. Yes, I know. That is very important.
yeah it is okay. it is important that the younger children should should have been there yeah, yeah. rather than 10 to 15 you could have avoided yeah. 10 to 15 age group ah, but yeah. you should try to include okay. l- less age yeah. because yeah. that's the idea to identify yeah. and, various uh, causes of blindness in that particular age group causes like retinoblastoma yeah, squint yeah. and other yeah. things like congenital anomalies and for that you can uh, enter into yeah, anganwadis yeah. even mm. anganwadis are having younger children and the, the teachers need to be there you know they yeah. need to be counseled The program itself says there is a science teacher, there is a yes. way having a space, everything is there. You have told it is as per the MC, MPDB. So, MPDB guidelines says what? Which teacher will do the training? Responsible teacher has to be involved. So, teachers, teachers, train the trainers. Train the trainers, like you can train the teachers also. Mm-hmm. Just cannot right. okay. And include yeah. Anganwadi yeah. teachers yeah. also. Yeah. That will be benefited to you. Hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. no. sir, anything no, you want no, to no. say? All I think it was a wonderful session. Yeah, All the chair, chairpersons and judges, we were uh, quite happy to assess. Forget about the mass. It was a great and learning experience for yes. all of you. The only thing, there is a generation gap. And all your presentations included few things like teleophthalmology, artificial intelligence, smartphones. <laughs> so less of clinical skills and more of something Technology. instrumental. Yeah. So the take home message is, don't forget your original skills, your clinical skills, your surgical skills. Nowadays, everything is getting replaced by the machine. Probably the day may come when the artificial machine will examine the patients and there will not be any artificial role of doctors. Is also coming. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Examine, are there. Artificial but always, human being is always superior than them. Because like, they make the medicine. Mm-hmm. Like your medicine surgery, not making human beings. Like your surgery will be done by robots. Your refraction will be done by optometrists, mm-hmm. spectacles will be done uh, by op- opticians and everything will be done by others and will be sitting there putting but something remember, and taking out the notes. Always human beings are superior to medicines. Always. Yes. Who created this? So your role, you shouldn't forget your role as clinicians. I am saying not doctors, as clinicians. That's very important. And that's the thing which is taught to you in MBBS curriculum, post-graduation like MS, DNB or DMS. So don't forget that. That is the thing which will only take you ahead of you others and the comparison will be there with that particular knowledge and don't forget that everything should be rooted through the society general public at large even if you are working in the corporate culture because you have come for medicine basically becoming doctor is rooting to the society rooting to general public and not for high fi and corporate culture thank you thank you so much thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Uh, one photograph you can take so change karo piche ka background are ajay bhai ajay re Uh, you can take my mobile also. Hmm. Yes, easy.